A concentric tube heat exchanger with thin walled inner tube operates in a counterflow mode. Interpret what that term right there, thin walled inner tube mean. Thin walled. It's going to be a negligible resistance to conduction through that wall. So it has a 25 millimeter inner tube diameter and 45 millimeter outer tube diameter. Sometimes you sketch it like this and then like this, so the inner and outer diameter. So I have some fluid flowing in the tube, some fluid flowing counterflow in the annulus. Okay, where is the heat transfer occurring? Is the heat transfer occurring from here to there and you have a convection to get it to the tube surface and a convection resistance to get it off of that tube surface to the fluid in the, in the tube? Yeah. So you might want to think 1 over U is 1 over H on the inside plus 1 over H on the outside. That's a pretty simple equation for the overall convection heat transfer coefficient. What does it neglect again? Resistance in the wall. And what is the difference between the area on the outside and the area on the inside of that thin wall tube? They're the same. And so I don't have to struggle with what area do I put here and here and here. Do I put area inside, area outside, and then area inside or outside there? They're all the same area if it's thin walled, true? So a lot of times it's a little simpler like that. Uh, is there a heat transfer across the larger, the 45 millimeter outer diameter tube? Is there a heat transfer across that tube surface? No, it's well insulated. It's what you might call an adiabatic heat exchanger. If you took me for thermodynamics, I said that can be a tricky term, adiabatic heat exchanger. It's like, hold it. Well insulated heat exchanger? How does that make sense? Well, it's well insulated with respect to the surroundings, and inside of it, there's a lot of heat transfer between a hot fluid and a cold fluid flowing inside of it. So I like to draw like this for the heat exchanger kind of put it like this, maybe put the hot fluid flowing that way if you like, put the cold fluid flowing that way if you like, and talk about the hot in and the cold in, etc. So we have water at 0.2 kilograms per second at 25 C enters the inner tube. So I'm, after I read the problem a little bit, the temperature of the cold coming in is 25 degrees C, and we have the mass flow rate of the cold is 0 0.2 kilograms per second. All right, then we have oil, so this is water. And then we have oil for the hot fluid. And we have oil at a mass flow rate, m dot h is 0 0.1 kilogram per second. And it enters temperature hot in of 130 degrees C and it's flowing through the annulus, but it really doesn't matter which one's flowing through the annulus, which one's flowing through the tube, unless they give us more information. But here they, it's, it's, it could be switched for this problem. And it exits, so we have the temperature hot out of 70 degrees C. The overall heat transfer coefficient U, I'm not gonna rewrite that, but is given in the last sentence. U is equal to 110 watts per meter squared degree C. They give us all the properties, mass density, specific heat, the kinematic viscosity, uh, the uh, thermal conductivity, and the Prandtl number. And for our water, as well as for our oil. And then they ask for part A, calculate the rate of heat transfer. What is the symbol for the answer for part A that we want to calculate? Q. And what would be the units for the answer for part A? Watts or kilowatts, something like that. How would you solve for it? I'm going to pause. I'm going to walk around and see how far you get on this one. All right, so a lot of us don't want to overlook the obvious. You can calculate Q one of three ways. From the perspective of what comes out of the hot, from the perspective of what goes into the cold, as well as a rate equation which is limiting. That's the hard one. That's the hard one. So the easy one here is if I wanted to calculate Q, I know the mass flow rate of the hot fluid, the specific heat of the hot fluid, the temperature hot in minus the temperature hot out. True? Yes. 
Yes. And what did we calculate when we threw our numbers in? What did we get? 11,400 watts or 11.4 kilowatts. True? Is that what we calculated? Very good. Now on to part B. Outlet water temperature. How are we going to calculate the outlet water temperature? I'm going to pause, walk around, and see how you do. All right, for part B, so what we have is Q is equal to what goes into the cold. And what goes into the cold is mass flow rate of the cold, specific heat constant pressure of the cold, temperature cold out minus temperature cold in. Hence, the temperature cold out will be the temperature cold in plus Q divided by, if you like shorthand, you put heat capacity rate of the cold fluid, cap C of the cold fluid. But that's just the product. And so when we run that number, the temperature of the cold out comes in at 38.6 38 degrees C. True? Very good. Thank you. Good. Very good. Okay. Now, the last part is a little harder. We want the length of the heat exchanger. So if you could calculate the length of the heat exchanger, it'll take you a little bit longer, but please try that. So what we did was we calculated right here that the temperature of the cold out was 38.6 degrees C. So what I would do is I'd say delta T1 is the temperature difference between the hot and the cold on that end, and the delta T1 would be 130 minus 38.57 or 91.43 degrees C. You see how I get delta T1? And they come over here on this end, delta T2 on that end, temperature hot out minus temperature cold in, 45 degrees C. I would actually encourage you on exams and homework to do that like those steps. Because sometimes people will get all discombobulated and they say, oh, I just put the temperature hot where it needed to be the cold and it keeps you from making a mistake. Once I have that, can you calculate the log mean, delta T log mean? That would be maybe delta T1 minus delta T2 divided by the natural log of delta T1 over delta T2. Uh, make sure that the first time you try to calculate the log mean temperature difference isn't on the next test. Yeah, uh, you want to have that down. How many people can calculate it? What do you get for this problem right now? 65.5. <clears throat> Professor, do I have to put all these in Kelvin? Uh, no, you don't. It's a temperature difference. Okay, it's a temperature difference. So now that I know what is the delta T log mean, I go back to my rate equation. Q is equal to UA delta T log mean. I kind of put check marks. Do I know Q? Sure do. Do I know U? Hey, it's given to me in the problem statement. Did I just calculate the log mean temperature difference? I can now calculate the area from that equation. True. That equation is like the first two equations that we used for part A and part B, but it's the rate equation. The other were just conservation of energy statements. So this is really a rate equation. We, we calculate that the area, whoops, area comes in at 1.58 meters squared. That's how large I need to have it. And that area is made up of pi dl. Isn't that how we calculate it, pi dl? So the length is the area divided by pi d. The length comes in at 20.2 meters. 20.2 meters. Look good? I wanted to also solve it using the effectiveness NTU method instead of the log mean temperature difference method. How would we solve it using the effectiveness NTU method? Well, you say the number of transfer units is UA over C min. So I'm going to be trying to get A. That means I need to get UA. That means I need to get NTUs. So it's kind of like I'm sizing it by finding out how big it is. Well, I look and I say for counterflow concentric tube, there's a relationship. The number of transfer units is equal to CR 
and effectiveness right there. So what is uh, C sub R? C min over C max. And when I take a look at what was my minimum, the minimum comes from the hot fluid at 190 watts per Kelvin divided by the maximum, the cold fluid, 840 watts per Kelvin or watts per degree C, either one, it's, it's a temperature difference. So the C sub R comes in at 0 0.2262. What about the effectiveness? I need the effectiveness. Well, it's the actual Q divided by Q max. Well, what was Q max? The minimum heat capacity rate times the temperature hot in minus temperature cold in. So the minimum heat capacity rate is 190 watts per degree C. And then the hot in was 130. The cold in was 25 degrees C. And so Q max comes in at 19,950 watts. So we had 11,400 watts, the actual, divided by 19,950 watts. Doesn't it seem like you're going a completely different route? We're going to get the same answer, but we're using the effectiveness NTU method. This comes in at 0 0.57143, so 57.143%. So put that in for the effectiveness there, put in for the C sub R there, and you calculate the number of transfer units. Comes in at 0 0.91611. Then I see that UA is equal to the number of transfer units times C min. And I calculate UA to be 140, uh, 174.06 watts per degree C. Then the area is UA divided by U. So we divide by the given U, which was, what was that, 110? And you count 1.5824 meters squared, same answer. You get length is area divided by pi d. Add the completed, it's the same L is equal to 20.15 meters. So you can go either route. Once you get more familiar with the effect of this NTU, you, you typically prefer it. You typically prefer it. One of the advantages is they have these great tables where they have it, whether they want, you know, NTU as a function of effectiveness or the other tables where you have effectiveness as a function of NTU. When is the real benefit? It's typically when you only know the inlet temperatures, not any of the outlet temperatures, and you have to calculate it. Then you get into the guessing and iterating game with the effectiveness, not the, with the log mean temperature difference, but the effectiveness sent to you is no, no iteration required. But you almost have to see that to understand that.